Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction's Patreon 101. I call BS. Before we got started uh, and you hit record, nice. you said this will be this is going to be a fun one. This or is something. This is this is going to be a fun to, one to, to to extend. And I have to assume you were talking to yourself because there's no way you could be talking to me, the person who is your victim during this. I when you said that, I like pictured like a like a Monty Python scene where like there's an executioner, yes, and maybe he has a new axe and he yeah. just can't wait to try it out. And he like says in front of the guy like whose head he's about to remove. This will be a fun one. And to be fair, if it's a nice new sharp axe, that is better for the person getting their head cut off, too. Yeah, I, I, but, I mean, it might be a stretch for that person to consider this fun. So, you're welcome? No, no. <laughs> fuck you. And fuck, I want I want this to be gruesome for everybody in the audience. Swing t- twice. Swing three times. Dull that blade. Oh, uh, dear. I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. David, how you doing this afternoon? I am doing great. And plus, I've seen the way you swing an axe. I'll be fine. Oh, I'm great with an axe. I'll out-axe you. You're stronger than I am, but I'll out-axe you. I got better axe form. Whoa, whoa, Bobby. You know what, Bobby? Looks like you and I are... Looks like Science Faction's going to Canada. (laughs) The only place we can legally get an axe. I mean, like, if we wanted to shoot along in half with a semi-auto rifle, we could do that here. But it's it's really (laughs) illegal to have just axes lying around. It's dangerous. Bobby, I don't know. Like, listen, uh, the cost, of the, the Second Amendment doesn't protect your right to bear axes. In Canada, it does. All right. Uh, True freedom. You no, know, I just pictured. I pictured that's where most like uh, lumberjack competitions happen, and like there'd be like people to really judge. Because you and I, I'm gonna say I, I beat you. You're gonna say you beat me. I want an impartial Canadian. I want a beaver to judge me. We set up a hundred logs and see who splits the most, the fastest. Oh, we're doing like a John Henry Irons versus the machine. I'm yeah. assuming I'm the machine because that's cultural appropriation, Bobby. Oh, uh, dear. Now, uh, I call BS a game where I, for, I read four science news articles, some which are real, some which are, are BS any for bad science. They can all be true, all be false, any combination in between. They're all independent variables. I will say this particular episode, because it's a 101st episode as a gift to our fans and to Damien, I... <laughs> I have made a theme, and so I, I will I will see how well that theme gets through. All right, uh, so Damien, are you ready to play your very special edition of I Call BS? The person on the uh, headsman's uh, b- chopping block looks up and smiles, and, and says, yeah, absolutely, ask away, Lord, let's see how dull that axe is. All right, let's play I Call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. Article number one. A new study out finds that a cheap, easily available Spanish drug affectionately called cafe can have a significant positive impact on cognition and reduce the accumulation of plaques seen in Alzheimer's. Damien, is this science or bad science? Uh, this is science. Uh, coffee has the ability to, uh, I have heard, we, I believe we have covered on this show, uh, the, uh, the effects of coffee on Alzheimer's. Did you think you could get that one by me, a mestizo? Oh. The Mr. I practically Cheech Marin, Bobby. I'm I, You're recording with a Danny Trejo-esque uh, figure in the Latino community. I see. You can show a little respect. I should. I should. And let me... Let me say, Damien, unfortunately, it was bad science. Um, I didn't realize I was t- speaking to such a, a Latino master, if you will. Uh-huh. But they did. The researchers did find a drug that could improve cognition and decrease Alzheimer's plaques. It was common. It was readily available. And you guys who uh, are a bit more mestizo than Damien might have been ki- tipped off by the fact that the word cafe is Spanish for brown because that drug is cinnamon. You... You know what? I'm done. I've been looking for an excuse to tell you this for a while. Here's fuck your two weeks notice. It's you true, Damien. My... Cinnamon has. By the way, also grow up, Damien. Uh, cinnamon has anti. <laughs> Says the guy who texts me cinnamon jokes at three in the fucking morning. 
<laughs> off of something, <laughs> off of like an incident that I didn't even care about, but now I care. It oh, sounds like you care. Bobby, sounds like you, you care. made me care. Sounds like you care. So, so Damien, as I'm sure <laughs> you're aware, cinnamon has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and anti-cancer properties. This research looked at 40 studies that focused on the benefits of cinnamon consumption for learning and memory. Uh, the research looked at numerous studies that showed everything from in vivo to in vitro and from cinnamon and its components, including cinnamonic acid, eugenol, and cimatolohyde, had a positive effect on cognitive function. Also, in in vitro studies, uh, cinnamon increased the cell viability while reducing Alzheimer's-associated tau aggregation and amyloid beta plaques. So, for all we know, as Damien liked to call it, brown is actually like a miracle drug that's just been hiding in our spice cabinets this entire time you you there's like this one stupid joke that if do you even remember what what patreon episode it was where i said this thing where i said this long running joke that your cat that you could direct fans to that you could detour them all i remember was that uh the answer was about uh, there's fur turning more cinnamon colored and Damien insisted instead in his answer that it was turning more brown colored and you know I, for the past however long we've been arguing about how those are different concepts that was, you're right uh, that, I, and as fans remember that was all it took and uh, to go back and listen to that episode if not to get inside on that joke but to see uh, a beautiful thing the genesis of a new I call BS role those don't happen every day folks no, sometimes sometimes uh, regular shows just automatically assume cinnamon and brown are two different concepts. They don't actually have to be codified in rules. But this show, hey, anything for Damien. I'm going to beat the fucking cinnamon <laughs> out of you. Do you understand? <laughs> Article number two. I'm going to follow you to your car with a sock full of quarters and hit you until cinnamon is running down your leg. Do you understand? <laughs> Uh, article number two, an analysis of ancient migration patterns in Southeast Asia suggests that one of the motivating factors for large scale human migrations in the area was urine content of the popular crop, Ethrolium novogranitens. This is science. Uh, if you're somebody who herds animals, uh, yeah, uh, you, you can only stay in a piece of land until your cow or whatever animal that is in Latin is pissed it all up. Uh, then you got to take up your yep. new toilet. <laughs> That's why they, they have that old saying, like, you can lead a horse to the fields, but you can't make him piss on that rice. <laughs> oh, he'll do it. You just have to pretend that you don't want him to do it. It was a saying perpetrated by 13-year-old boys in ancient times. <laughs> <laughs> so, Damien, uh, sorry, this one is a bad science. Researchers did not find that an ancient migration pattern in Southeast Asia suggests that one of the motivating factors for large-scale human migration in the area was the urine content of a crop whose name you might be familiar with as la coca or cocaine. Because indeed, Damien, it was not... Pee pee in their coke that made ancient <laughs> Southeast Asians <laughs> migrate. <laughs> it was right there and I missed it. <laughs> well, by the way, for some of our older fans uh, or, or our long running fans, I didn't mean to insult your age. You're still young and beautiful. 22 year old fan for the seventh time. Yes, please. I would uh, like back in the early days of science faction. Yes. I made a reference. I've used that joke uh, whenever I could. Yes. Uh, you know, that old like grade school uh, saying that's certainly not cool and problematic. Now yeah. Me Chinese, me play joke, me put PP in your Coke. Yes. Yes. But I, I like I would subtly hint at it, and Bobby would look at me like, "How dare you declass my science podcast with that fucking joke?" And here we are, many years <laughs> later, and you've you've lived long enough to become the Damien. Congratulations, Bobby! <laughs> become the villain, uh, dear. Uh, no, Damien. In fact, what they by the way, grow up. Uh, by the way, what they found. <laughs> That's the second. Why are you saying this to me? <laughs> You're just talking about pee pee and your coke. You can't get over the brown cinnamon thing. They found out. 
was uh, one of the mo- largest motivating factors for movement in humans in ancient times, which is actually not too surprising, was sea level rise. So if you think of Southeast Asia, now this goes back 26,000 years. If you think of kind of like the Malaysia Peninsula and then islands like Sumatra and Borneo and Java, those are all islands now. We call that island Southeast Asia. Those were all part of a mega peninsula back in the day called Sundaland. And that was basically a giant extension peninsula off of Asia. Well, as sea levels rose over those 26,000 years, it is huge, gigantic piece of land basically became scattered islands. And with it, the people who had been living in that area had to be the first climate refugees and be running away from that, those rising sea levels. And they became isolated in these islands. And what's really interesting is you can see in the genetics how that isolation in those places ended up kind of shaping the history and the the genetic history of Southeast Asia. So here's a couple of interesting things that they found. They found that over two periods of rapid sea level rise of around 46 to 22 millimeters a year, the thing that was once one giant giant landmass became a whole bunch of different islands. Then... Because at that same time, the planet was getting warmer, because remember, we're coming out of an ice age, more warmer planet, more available energy, there's more production of the stuff, especially plants in the area, and so you have more production of food, which leads to higher levels of population, even as these people are fleeing lands that they no longer can be on, which means that not only do they move around a bunch, but they end up reoccupying mainland Asia after being, you know, occupying this area for tens, if not more thousands of years, they end up having to migrate back and populations of them migrate back into mainland Southeast Asia and become huge parts of the genetic stories of that entire area, which is obviously a very important area through historic and into modern times. And really, really interesting because Basically, this process of inundation of water in Sundaland starting 26,000 years ago and heading to now has not only scattered a bunch of people and created just genetic isolation, but it's forced groups of people that otherwise wouldn't be together to be together and shape the genetic legacy of that entire area. One would say the entire continent, all because of kind of the unguided force of just sea level slowly rising where people had occupied for tens of thousands of years. So let me get this straight. You decided to include the Latin name for cocaine, uh-huh. which you can't pronounce yes. at all, True. as demonstrated on this. Yes. yes. Just to cram this. Okay. Fair enough, Bobby. Yeah, that was that was good. Uh, in doing this, you decided to let everybody know that you can't read. <laughs> Latin, specifically Latin. That's true. Article number three. <laughs> A new paper out suggests that Africa's entire wheat crop could be completely destroyed by a single common pest, which is now starting to be found in parts of Africa. Damien, is this science or bad science? Well, I haven't heard of any mass migration of people from Florida to Africa. Mm. And that was going to be like, you know, like, oh, my God, we found jet skis on the off the coast of Johannesburg. So there was an old Mountain Dew can in the little in the can holder. <laughs> Hold on, wait, dude. That's a speedo. Means he went skinny deeping. He's still out there. The jet ski keys have a novelty truck nuts on them. <laughs> oh my god! This uh, jet ski has. It looks like somebody painted a Captain Morgan on it. Is that like a manatee death count? Is this thing's killed twelve manatees. And then like a a tracker comes and they do the thing where they like, they scan their finger, they push their finger across the jet ski and then lick their finger and they go, a 14 year old was impregnated on this jet ski. (laughs) People go like, I wonder uh, what type of engine it has. And when they open it up, there's not an engine. It's just a bunch of meth. How did it get here? (laughs) And then if you open it up a little bit further, there's also three raccoons running a paddle wheel. Close that door. We were promised a deal. Um, I'm going to say that this is bad science. Yeah, I picture if anything, like it, like a, a species from Africa has made its way to Florida. Oh, uh, dear. Uh, this one is bad science, Damien, but not because of your reasoning, but because they did find almost all of the continent of Africa was vulnerable to a complete destruction of one of their most important crops, and that crop was... 
maze. <laughs> as, as the native Africans call it, maze. <laughs> so, you know what's funny? So, I saw this as a headline. I realized it would fit in, a, uh, in my science faction themed <laughs> I Call BS episode. <laughs> I'm getting it. I get I get your I get your theme. <laughs> and so and so I, I actually I saw it, it was titled Maze and I, went, I was like, why the fuck do some people call it Maze? And I looked it up. So calling it corn is like a North American thing. And if you're in Europe or other parts of the world, it's frequently referred to as maize until weirdly you serve it. So like the crop is maize, but you eat popcorn. You don't eat like pop maize. This is why our dictionary is running circles around theirs. <laughs> That's right. By the way, us, the uh, the suffix "usi" was added in this year, as oh. in Taco Bell uh, gets my takusi wet. <laughs> Jesus. That's in a <laughs> sentence. Yeah, it's in the fucking Webster's. We've lost the dictionary now. <laughs> Well, again, I mean, maybe now people from Florida will start reading it. But the pest is <laughs> is the fall armyworm. And outbreaks of the fall armyworm in Africa were first observed in southwest Nigerian maize fields in January 2016. And thereafter in Benin, Togo, to Benin, Togo and other places. Since then, the pest has spread to more than 40 African countries, including Ethiopia, Kenya and Tanzania. This is actually really terrifying because uh, this has the potential to completely wipe out the crop in all of Africa. One of the problems is they essentially grow a very genetically similar crop throughout Africa, and that makes it very vulnerable to these types of things. They've just never had this pest before. This pest comes from the Americas. They've never had it, and so they've never had to worry about it. But now that it's found there, it has the potential to wipe out the entire crop. I think they have like a I think it's like a hundred billion dollar a year, you know, maize corn industry out there. And so like this could really, if you're talking about a place that already needs the food it makes and then, you know, could have that food cut by a lot, that's terrifying. Like, uh, like, uh, like that's right. I'm a, I'm an angler from Texas and I bring my own worm bait, even if I'm <laughs> shark hunting in Johannesburg and, and he just like drops the can of, like, how do worm, it's not like a, something that's like shipped over with produce, I would imagine. Uh, it could be. No, it absolutely can be. Like, it, it, it oh. most certainly came from something like that, some kind of weird shipping channel thing. Then why did we ship it on those heat-treated pallets? <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, article number four. This is what I found the most interesting. A new paper out suggests a striking and unexplained sociological pattern with highly successful Hollywood male actors. And I want to stop here and just point out. This is not one of those science papers that goes like successful male actors. And they're like, this guy was in a Neosporin commercial. They are literally like I saw their list. Everybody they are talking about is absolutely A-list and nobody would not call them A-list. All right. So that being said, so what, what did they observe? That successful male actors who have two sons, not one son, not three sons, but two sons almost always have one of their sons also become a successful actor while the other almost always becomes an unsuccessful loser. The phenomenon is observed with around 93% accuracy across all individuals studied, which, by the way, is higher than the percentage of inheritability of height. All right, Damien, is this science or bad science? Now, let's see. Okay, you've said this, and I'm going through all the examples in my head. Now, obviously, they're the Hanks boys, right? Who was that? Colin Hanks and Chet Hanks. Uh -huh. Okay. Well played, Bobby. That's one. Who are their parents? Uh, Rita Wilson, Tom Hanks. And then there's Colin Hanks and Chet Hanks. Now, Chet Hanks arguably has made a name for himself in his own mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in the being a piece of crap sector. Sure. Uh, d d define success. He lives better than I do. Sure. So, uh, then I thought, uh, okay, what about uh, Charlie? Sh uh, um, what about Martin Sheen, who mm -hmm. has uh, Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen? And I don't know right. if they're half brothers or not, but let's assume they're full yeah. brothers. Both of them have had very successful careers. That's true. Although one of them is the clean cut one, and one of them is the bad boy. All right. That's true. So maybe there. And then if you think of like um, Kirk Douglas, who has his sons, Michael Douglas and John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> it's just like the Estevez ch changed the last name uh, I am going to say that this is it's too implausible bad science as much as I want to, to give this to you as much as this would blow my mind if it was a scientific fact I'm going bad science 
All right, Damien, and this one is bad science because I completely made it up. But that didn't stop you from mentioning Tom Hanks, who, of course, in 1982 played Dr. Dwayne Twitchell as his breakout <laughs> role on Happy Days. All right, I'm done. Um, we're, we're done. <laughs> I didn't make you say it. Did I make you, you say you can, Tom Hanks? Did I come in here and force you somehow <laughs> to yell the name of a guy who not only was on Happy Days as a guest star, but literally that's what made him famous. That's what later got him the Ron Howard uh, uh, TV show that then made him uh, Splash or whatever, that then made him famous, movie that made him famous. So, so he he owes his fame to the TV show Happy Days that you're not supposed to talk about in this particular show. And yet... You're such a piece of shit. <laughs> At the very end. Oh, I made you do that. I made you break the rules. I made you, Damien. Uh, and if I didn't hit, uh, we're not allowed to say that word anymore. If I didn't hit a person from Romania who's, uh -huh. who has it lives a transitory lifestyle uh -huh. with my car. Yes. Uh, while denouncing science, while uh, saying that uh, uh, vaccines cause autism. I mean, David, there's this a was lot my of, punishment. That nobody forced you to start speaking about Tom Hanks and his beautiful children, or your love for them, or <laughs> wow. why you would bring them up, <laughs> completely unrelated to anything else we were talking about. Nobody forced you, but you, oh, knowing dear. full well his his origin story. I know you've seen his IMDb before. He's a famous movie star. We all know that. You you might as well just started yelling, "Oh, happy days, bosom buddies!" Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry to impugn Chet Hanks' good name. My mistake. Yes, you, know, you are. I'm, I'm all talk on this. I'm out. I'm no. out. No. Hold on, David. No, because that, <laughs> that was a completely manufactured science article, which is why that's false. But we did discover something totally super interesting that has nothing to do with that whatsoever, <laughs> which is eight possible radio signals from space that might be attributed to alien intelligence. So this is a really interesting study that used AI to scan the radio signatures of 150 terabytes of astronomical data. Remember that episode where Fonz jumped a spaceship? <laughs> Basically, they used this AI algorithm to look through all this astronomical data. And because AI can look through so much more and see so many more things, they taught it first, like, here's what radio signals from Earth look like, then look for stuff that, you know, uh, might look similar. And it did, and it looked through this amazing amount of data, and it found eight that had a possibility. Now, doesn't mean these eight are from aliens, doesn't mean they're likely from aliens, doesn't even mean that it's possible, that we, we won't know until we study it further. The more striking thing is we have all this data. We have had for decades tons of astronomical data that's basically stored on computers and will never be looked at because unless you're doing a research project that needs that data, all we do is grab it and store it. But if we have things like AIs, these advanced AIs, they can go back through that data and find these things for us and possibly find these signs of life springing from the universe, the needle in that proverbial haystack that we otherwise can't see by just, you know, 24 hours a day, you could have a chatbot going through this astronomical data and looking for, you know, correlation number one. Okay, now correlation number two, now correlation number three. And we could start narrowing down at least possibilities of things that look, you know, like the wow signal did or something like that. I've heard that uh, that data looks really good. It just doesn't do hands very well. Yeah, hands and hair motion tends to be a problem. <laughs> uh, that's why we'll be. That's why Skynet doesn't stand a chance. It can't properly mimic hands, so it's very inefficient at firing firearms. <laughs> they look at things like whether the signals change in frequency over time in a way that makes them appear far from the telescope. They look at whether or not they are present, like the signals are present when you look at the star and absent when you look away as opposed to, you know, something that's just always there. So by doing this, they think they have narrowed in on that eight. They will undoubtedly find some of those are just natural, if not all of them. But the point is we're doing it, man. Like this is how we would find it. You know, SETI, who goes out and looks for this stuff paired with some kind of AI that can digest all of this information, this massive amount of information that we could never digest with a million lifetimes. If you combine those two things together, fuck the spaceships, you know, coming from out of space or something like that. Like, that is how we're going to find aliens. We're going to find them with really advanced telescopes hooked up to really advanced computers. Or they've already found us. Bobby, what if I told you that the safest place for an alien to hide would be at SETI? Like if a bunch of what if, you know, I'm just saying a bunch of men in black, people from right. outer space came and said, like, we're going to set up this organization to 
find aliens. Okay, I like this. I like this. So so they're doing it, and they're doing the thing where like you're the the investigator who's investigating the crimes you're committing, so you can constantly cover up the evidence of what you're doing. That's right. You're the um you're the arsonist fire inspector. Super, super interesting. I, I love that kind of stuff. I love real alien shit. I When I was a kid, I used to be into like the fake pseudo alien stuff and think it was so interesting. And oh my God, you know, I want to be the one to find it. Or look, these people are finding it and they're keeping it from us. And now that I live in the real world of facts and, and reality, the real part of it is super interesting to me. Like, I don't think we're ever going to see an alien ship in our lifetime, but we really very well could get a signal, a radio signal from space from another civilization. And like, frankly, that's just as cool in a lot of ways. You're able to communicate with something on the other side of the universe. And that might be, you know, our generation's version of landing on the moon. What if aliens come to Earth, say that they're massive fans of our podcast and mm -hmm. that um, they want to make me a god because of my ability to commune with the spirits? An ability that, there's, that their species does not exist, does not possess. Then we'd fight them with all the might the Earth has. Like, I I know we don't have the real Avengers, but I have a 16-pound sledgehammer, and uh, I'm willing to do some damage with it. <laughs> he does not speak for us. He is, an, he is the lesser half of our science show. Let us ignore him, Gloop and Glarp. Please, take me back to your big titty civilization. <laughs> I'm going to talk to these aliens the way you talk to the new kid in class who accidentally talks to the nerd at lunch. Hey, listen, bro. Uh, I know I know you don't know the way things work out there. Uh, just so you know about him, like he's really going to ru ruin your reputation. No one's going to want to hang out with you. Uh, if you go with his side, you're going to lose. I'm just I'm just letting you know because you're the new guy around here, aliens, and I, I want you to have a you know a fair shake at everything. Oh, if that's the case, well then, Damien, let's just. Be cool for now and see how things go. Bobby, take me to the kicker! <laughs> Back to the titty planet! How come Bobby and all the world's leaders get to go to the kegger and I don't? Thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction's Patreon 101, the Science Faction-themed edition, where you learned all about how cinnamon can have positive impacts on cognition and reduce accumulation of plaques associated with Alzheimer's disease. How an ancient human migration in Southeast Asia was driven by sea level rise. How Africa might soon experience gigantic famine as their entire maize crop might soon be demolished by the army worm. And how we might have just found eight potential signs of life out in space. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 649. That's right, bitches. The aliens have come to Earth and we're probing everybody. Except Damien. Oh, fuck. I'm the only one who wants to be probed! You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right.